everyone and welcome to this episode, the Learning Theory one of the Women Talking About Learning podcast. I'm Andrew Jacobs. Before we get to the episode, we want to take a moment to address the United States Supreme Court decision to overturn Roe v. Wade on June the 24th, which stripped away the right to have a safe and legal abortion in the United States. Restricting access to abortion doesn't prevent people from seeking abortion, it simply makes it more deadly. We encourage our audience, American and otherwise, to learn more about what you can do to help at choice.crd.co. We encourage you to speak up, take care and spread the word. We've wanted to record this episode for ages, but weren't able to get the guests' availability lined up until recently, and so we're, we're really happy to say we've managed it at last. Our first guest is Helen Bailey. Helen is an award-winning interim L&D specialist and has worked in L&D for over 20 years across a variety of sectors including education, healthcare, retail and transport. She's passionate about mental health, leadership development and evidence-based L&D and has delivered talks on the latter for CIPD local branches. Our second guest is a returnee to the podcast, Rachel Burnham. Rachel is director and consultant for Burnham L&D and has worked in L&D and OD for about 30 years but she herself admits she's still learning about learning and learning about people. She specialises in using visuals to help people work across the private, public and voluntary sectors and, until very recently, was the chair of the CIPD in Manchester. This is Women Talking About Learning. This is Helen and Rachel talking about learning theory. Hello, Helen. Hi, how are you? Hi, Rachel. I'm good, thank you. And I'm very excited to talk about learning theory, of which there is much to talk about, I guess. Yes, and this is, um, we've been trying to talk about this for quite a while. We were going to record this podcast back in January (laughs) and then I was ill. So it's much delayed and fantastic at last to get chatting about learning theory. Absolutely. And I think probably a good place to start is yeah, what what are the good bits? What are the things that we really, really like? And I'm quite happy to sort of kick off with that. Um, so I've got two kind of things that I kind of hold on to uh, in my professional life. One is David Meyer and his sort of accelerated learning principles, because they kind of make sense to me. And the other is Ebbinghaus and this idea that learning fades away um, if you don't use it. And those kind of things guide me I guess in in my design and delivery work what about you is is there any that kind of really ping out to you well because I've got so interested in the use of visuals and how visuals can aid learning um, some of the things that I've particularly got interested in are things like dual coding theory and Mm -hmm. the idea of the visual argument by Alan Pavio but I guess for me the key thing with these is not really that they're a learning theory it's that they're backed up with research and that there's actually some evidence mm-hmm. to uh, support them so I suppose one of the things for me is well what do we mean by learning theory because there's all sorts of things that are ideas that are bounded about as learning theory and some of them are very well founded and have a really strong sort of evidence base. And um, some of them are um, misused, shall we say, and kind of distorted and um, yep, might have absolutely. come from something, but, but kind of have, have kind of got a life of their own. And sometimes when you look back at where they've come from, you can hardly recognize them. And then there are some things, well, I don't quite know how to put this politely, but they're sort of dreamed up. They've just come from somebody's head, and which is fine because that's actually what a theory is, isn't it? It's it's you trying to work out how do how do I make sense of what's going on in the world um, and the Mm -hmm. things that I have noticed, the things that I have observed. But it is only your theory. And but you could, of course, you could nice as any any sort of learning consultant. And I'm speaking as a freelance learning consultant. You can package <laughs> something nicely and put it forward as being this is the Burnham learning theory. And it might not have any basis to it. And I guess for me, that's a key thing is what's what's behind it? Where does it come from? Has it been tested? All of these sorts of all of these sorts of uh, uh, things. I think the context and, as you say, the the research, because I think sometimes these things are really blindly applied. So if you take Maya and one of the things that he talks about is positive emotions aid learning. 
Okay. So that suggests to me that everybody should be having a really nice time. And I was having this discussion with a colleague this week, actually, about, well, if you want a nice time, you can go bowling, you can go to a restaurant, you don't need me for that, you know. Um, And I believe that positive emotions aid learning, but it's about the context in which you're working. So, for example, I used to work for a hospice. And if you're having conversations about people at end of life, that is not necessarily a positive emotions experience in terms of the conversations you're having. And I think, you know, if you're trying to make things jolly, happy, whatever word you want to use there, but not really thinking about how does that work in the context, that can feel very, there's a dissonance there, I think, sometimes. So that idea of, you know, researching and blindly applying things, you know, is very dangerous because actually what what it does, it has the opposite effect. Yeah, so it might actually be um, not beneficial. It might actually detract mm from from the learning and and rather than having that impact of actually leading to um, some kind of change in performance some kind of positive um, step forward for individuals uh, something that they can use and apply in their workplace it can actually be a a barrier if it's if Mm -hmm. it's not used well I mean I think that's a really good example that one about you know that of of um, where are the boundaries in um, what's the what's the situations in which this kind of theory or th- this kind of evidence really adds value and where are the yeah. limitations to it? So this is something that I I, I think we could be a lot more uh, a lot more thoughtful about which learning theories we apply and um, mm-hmm. a lot more. Um, uh, d- w- willing to dig into them, but then also thinking about where, w- in which situation should we be applying it? Um, so again, it's back to context, but it's also about where are the where are the limitations? So I know, for example, uh, taking my example of, of dual coding theory, Alan Pavio's work, it's very well researched in um Mm -hmm. in uh, through cognitive psychology there have been lots and lots of um uh, uh, research done on this um most of it however is relatively simple pieces of learning so dual coding theory is about the idea that if you learn something um through a combination of using words whether that's spoken or written and visuals it is um, better recalled. So there's lots of research, for example, in language learning, in use of terminology, but it's relatively simple pieces of learning rather than perhaps the more complex learning we might be doing in the workplace. For example, perhaps helping somebody to develop their management skills or helping Mm -hmm. somebody to be more effective, say, in customer service um, when applying the terms and conditions of your organization's um, uh, you know, products and, and, and so forth. So that's a slightly more complex. And actually, it's quite interesting to look at, well, what, you know, when you look at a piece of theory, when you look at the research behind it, if there is research behind it, where does it suggest it works? And are there limitations? Are there, is there a sort of boundary where it's saying, well, actually, this might work well, for example, with people who are beginners to this topic? And this kind of approach might work better with people who've got a lot more experience. And I think we could, we could get a bit more sophisticated about looking at um, these boundary conditions because that would help us to apply things a bit more carefully and it does link back to this point of context that you were making yeah I think it sounds like what we're saying is we need to challenge it more we need to be more robust in that approach and I think too often you see people um, in the in the L&D world being kind of quite blindly applying things where actually, does it really work? Is it going to work? And also, I think in L&D, you get more feedback than anywhere because you constantly get that feedback. If you're delivering something, you can see when it's not working, I think. And and, and there's a really good kind of, you know, that's a good gauge of, actually, this isn't quite working for me right now, and I need to flip that or I need to change it. 
you know, it's in the moment. Well, I think you can get immediate feedback about how well it's helping people to mm. grasp ideas and perhaps um, particularly if you're building in lots of participation and opportunities mm. to practice, you're getting, they're getting immediate feedback on how they're doing. But also you as a designer or as a facilitator of learning, you're getting immediate um more immediate mm-hmm. feedback but um i think that uh actually getting evidence about whether it helps people to translate it into performance that's a slightly more um tricky thing i mean i think when we're thinking about this idea about um which learning theories to apply and you know how do we how, how do we choose which ones um thinking about what sorts of things we should be looking at to see well which ones are relevant to us which ones um, are going to be effective so for example Mm. one of the things that um, I've been trying to do is to go back so rather than just if I see it something that looks like that might be relevant it might be applicable I'm wanting to try and go back and dig back to see well who is the author what's their background um what evidence have they gathered what research have they done and what was Mm. that research actually about so one of the pieces for example um is albert merribillions i can never say his name but anyway uh, about communication oh the very the very famous yes i guess (laughs) so this is this is about how communication how people communicate and it's used very very widely it's also critiqued a lot and criticized and uh, uh, and mm-hmm. actually that critique is 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 very sensible um so this is the idea that um uh most of what we communicate is through our body language and then um a percentage through our voice and our voice mm-hmm. tone and then a very small amount through our words but when you start and actually go back to his research he was actually talking about in a context where the person is talking about their feelings and emotions and one of the troubles with the way it's often used this piece of theory is that it's used in a much wider context so it's distorted and used in a much wider context yeah um when Actually, there isn't particularly an emotional context we're talking about. I don't know, maybe the introduction of a new policy or about all sorts of things. And therefore, it's not being used. Um, it's not it's being misused. So, I, I, Helen, what do you think? What, what other yeah. things lead us to, to look at theory and maybe apply it in a way that doesn't quite make sense? I think there's a lot of. I think I was reading that what I was going to say was I was reading a lot of stuff um, kind of in the build up to this. And one of the things that I came across uh, was something by Michelle Parry Slater. And she said, why shouldn't everything be on the table? And it kind of really made me think about actually we need to go wider. We need to stop thinking about necessarily theory and learning theory and being precious about learning theory and think, what is the other stuff that is out there that is equally applicable to us? Because I think there is a lot of stuff there that can be applied in terms of how we do learning and how we can make learning more effective at work. And particularly I'm thinking about things like some of the ideas in the Rebel Ideas book by Matthew Syed, um, very much... um, Uh, Radical Candor by Kim Scott which I feel like I've been obsessed with now for about six weeks Um, (laughs) but this idea so you know in this you know really thinking about and it does kind of link back to one of my you know seven uh, principles which is you know learning takes place doing the work itself with feedback but the idea that we give kind of robust feedback you know, so I think one of the things I've often seen is, you know, there is an activity and in the spirit of, you know, getting people involved, but then we don't give people robust feedback about the activity. Hmm. So it doesn't always come across um, as well as it could do. And, and have we really helped people learn in that way? Yeah, so we could actually be drawing upon a much wider range of sources um, of Ooh. ideas and evidence about what works so from broader um Mm -hmm. psychological uh 
uh, studies and fields from from marketing because that is about really about applied psychology and actually we could be drawing upon those and I guess again yeah. it's, it's again it's about looking at what's the evidence what you know what what work what what is the evidence that this is effective and um, and uh, applicable and using that as well? Are we, are we sort of saying that actually we need to go more evidence-based rather than learning theory-based? I think so. And I, I would wholeheartedly approve of that. I think if there was, if I had a middle name, it might be Helen Evidence-Based Bailey, you know, <laughs> <laughs> Because I think you can do all the, I know, I know, um, you could do all the, you can, you know, you, all these grand ideas, all these big ideas, what actually works? And what's the evidence to say that that will work? You know, I think that almost has to be the two fundamental questions we have to come back to all the time. Um, and as a result of that, if I was to give somebody coming into L&D some advice um I would say be curious be curious about everything because there is so much stuff that you can take which is not labeled learning theory but will help you do your job yes and also then also be curious about learning theory that you come across you know and ask those questions about where has Mm -hmm. that come from what's what's behind it um, you know, dig into that, um, you know, l- be critical, um, not for the sake of being critical, but to see mm-hmm. well, what, what, what is behind that. We know that there are um, uh, things that get into the sort of public consciousness on, or into the, even just in the, within the learning and development field, consciousness, and um, they hang mm-hmm. around there. And I think particularly when you first are coming into learning and development, mm-hmm. there are a lot of things that are presented and um, you you have to do that sifting, um, that testing out to really start to work out actually yeah. of, of all of these ideas, which ones have some basis um, and, and, and actually, I think that's quite difficult to do. That so you you almost need to do that bit about you know looking for more than one you know sort of source you know uh, uh, hearing different views on it, seeking out to see is there a critique already out there. I mean, I think that's amazing. I mean, we have to mention. I feel learning styles. I feel that I have to mention learning styles. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm very sorry about this, but but it's so it's so tick in the box. It's Rachel. so it's still so much out there. Yet there is also out there a very solid critique of it, and um, and 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 yet people aren't looking for that. Are often aren't looking for that. Yet it's out there, and. Um, What's amazing about about that is how the idea of of learning preferences, um, the the evidence is very strong that actually if you attempt to match learning to learning preferences, it doesn't lead to more effective learning. But because we, and I think this is where it's mm-hmm. it's quite tricky, it gets into this area of what we might feel works sometimes doesn't necessary because I know I like a good picture of course I love a good picture I wouldn't be doing sketch noting if I didn't love a good picture but actually (laughs) you can't just learn stuff by looking at you know I'm a visual learner I like pictures that's going to work actually you know you have to put things into practice and I'm not nobody's going to learn to drive a car safely by looking at some pictures only you know we have to do <laughs> stuff in practice let's not let's not do that research rachel <clears throat> yeah and i think um one of the things i, I would say a long time ago i, I went to um a, a session run by stella collins and uh, it, this this thing and it, it must be over sort of 10 years ago but this thing has always stayed in my mind about this do a little bit of everything And it it absolutely rings true to what you're saying there, Rachel, because if you kind of, you know, you go with the, you know, visual learners and we we position everything in that way, it doesn't help people actually do the fundamentals, which, 
is put things into practice and you know one of the things that I always reflect on in learning is you can do all the learning in the world but if people aren't going to use it why did you bother mm. you know it, it, it kind of feels like a you know I've put a lot of effort in and and if they're not going to use it you know it's use it or lose it almost yes 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 so I, I do think that we've we've got to be when we're looking at learning theory, it, it comes back to looking more critically at it, um, seeking to see is there is there a critique of it, looking mm-hmm. at what what its basis is, um, or has it been tested? Yeah. So obviously some theory d- develops mm-hmm. out of um, doing research and 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 then it's trying to make sense of the information and another learning theory it's been a, it's it's been an idea that somebody's had but then has it been tested and has it been put into practice and thoroughly tested and and it, it's yeah. those sorts of things and then I think the other thing is that then you've got this you've got learning theory that sometimes is it's it's well written it's superficially attractive it's we we can feel that response in us yeah but there might not be anything there behind it um so that's where we've yeah. just got to go a little so it attracts us because of the language yeah yeah the way it's presented it might ring true to us as mm. well and and that's where we've just got to be a little bit um cautious that doesn't mean to say it's wrong but but it's unproven and it's okay to have something that's a theory that's a hypothesis this is what's I think is going on but actually a lot of times things are presented as being this is how things are this is how it works and I, I know that there's a real temptation to present, to look for certainty and to present things, but actually sometimes a slightly more muddled picture is actually more accurate or a slightly more, we think it might be like this and that's okay. Mm-hmm. I, lo- I love the idea of that, of the muddled picture. And I think when you were talking, one of the things I, I was kind of thinking about is, you know, maybe there is a test and learn approach here about finding what works for us in the organizational context, about challenging what's out there. And maybe one of the things we have to do is is really be conscious about refining ourselves as L&D professionals in the light of what we've read, what we've seen, what we've done and evolving ourselves. And I know that, you know, in the pandemic, there was a definite evolution of a lot of people in the space because in terms of moving to that, to that more digital world. But I don't think you can be static in this space. I think you have to be constantly learning. You have to be constantly thinking about it. I think you do have to be, well, not constantly. You can have half an hour off in the evening if you want. Um, but you do <laughs> That's have most to generous. Have that. <laughs> You're wanting to change <laughs> I know I did really well there okay you can have 90 minutes all right okay um but you know just the idea of you know just by having this chat now it's making me think differently about some things that I may already do and I think that's really important in l and I think if we're going to be the best we can be it's having that constantly evolving approach I do like this idea of constantly refining what we do and needing to keep sort of mm. sharpening what it is that we're doing. And part of that is also having that willingness to let go and stop doing things. You know, it's not always about doing yes. more. And sometimes it's obviously about doing differently, mm-hmm. but sometimes it's also about not doing some things and having to stop to create, um, yeah, new new spaces yeah and I think you know when you were talking about that we will have theories that attract us in in some way I I definitely have things and I talked about the two things that really sort of sit quite deep for me and and kind of really inform my practice but then also recognizing that sometimes they're not always the right things to do um you know for me personally I do a lot of interim work so because of that, I'm kind of constantly, you know, going into new organizations, 
And it'd be quite easy, I think, in that space to just say, oh, I did that here and that definitely worked. So I'm going to take it here and just do it. (laughs) Yeah. However, given where the organization is in their space, that's not always the right thing to do. So, you know, I could be quite lazy about it, I guess. Um, But I I try hard not to be and, and really think about it, even though there are some things that I would love to do. Yes. You know, I, you know, I'm passionate about the curation um, of resources and how people use that in a sort of just in time way. But not all organizations are in that space, they're in that place in their sort of learning culture journey almost, I guess. We're back to the importance of context. In this case, organizational context. We are. <laughs> and and where they where where an organization is and what are the performance needs that we're wanting to make a difference to. Mm-hmm. So, it's, you know, we're, we're right back into testing things out in that, in that situation. I suppose the thing with learning theory is that it gives you broad principles mm-hmm. that, that, mm-hmm. that are guides, you know, they're guides, they're, they're, um, and, and, and maybe also questions for you, for, you know, for us about, what what sorts of things to be looking at and I'm just reflecting Rachel that I've been in lots of L&D and I'm sure you have as well been in lots of L&D meetings and nobody has ever brought up we do this because the learning theory tells us to do it (laughs) I know it's interesting sometimes yeah but I mean that's (laughs) and sometimes we have um Nobody's ever said we, we we do this because yeah, I guess I guess that sometimes we we fall we we fall into a way of working and don't take that actually why are we doing it in this particular way and that question and it's only one of mm. one of those one of those sorts of sources of information you know it's. The, the learning theory is part of that rich mix of things that you've got to take into take into account. So it's it's drawing upon the experience of practitioners in that area. It's 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 looking at the data of the own organisation, the needs that there are, what we know works in that organisation. If we mm-hmm. do have that information. Um, it's looking at stakeholders. Could we almost turn this on its head slightly? Say a bit more. Sorry, Rachel. I, w- I was just, I was having a, I'm having a thought moment. <laughs> yeah. So what I was thinking was sometimes what you find in L&D teams is, is what you have is lots of people with no learning experience for whatever reason. And, and they kind of want to be in L&D. And that's quite interesting, I think, if you work in those teams, because I don't know whether that if you have all the the qualifications and you've done all the research, do you become inhibited by it to a certain extent? Whereas people who don't have that, they kind of look at L&D perhaps in a slightly different way Hmm. and they'll kind of suggest things that that don't sit on that space. That's a kind of profound thought for us. Thursday morning so yeah so sometimes coming from outside of the field can actually bring new ideas new thoughts actually Mm. my experience sometimes is also sometimes coming from outside of the field can do that but it can also mean that people have a perhaps a more fixed idea perhaps around face-to-face and classroom of learning because, because that's what your experience has been and um so yeah so yeah Yes, different um, different experiences come into that. Do you think theory ever interferes with practice? I think it does, and it comes back to where we started, I guess, but I think it does if it's blindly applied because people just kind of go for it. I learned this. I learned this on my CIPD, whatever, tap, uh, you know, and therefore it is the right thing to do. And so if it's not questioned, it's not, you know kind of researched in that way you know if you if you suddenly I remember a long time ago talking about I'm going to call him Albert because I can never say second name either if that's okay (laughs) but talking about that and being challenged in that moment about it yes 
And there is something there for me about um, when I look back at that moment, I kind of think, oh, I'd wish I'd done more research and I wish I'd, I'd kind of been ready for that a bit more because there's something for me about the credibility of that. Yes. You know, if you are presenting something as fact and then being challenged in that moment and then not being able to come back or kind of have that discussion in a in a positive way, you know, um, I think I think that kind of that 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 kind of you know for me that kind of uh, lends itself to people thinking, oh, do you really know your stuff? Do you not? And then it starts to question everything, yeah. really, that you start to do. Yes, I mean, part of that comes from um, that sometimes we're asked to deliver programs that we haven't created. And don't necessarily have that full mm. <laughs> ownership with. So that comes back to this thing about, um, I suppose, working in an ethical way in almost, that you need to be able to mm. stand up behind stuff that you're using and that's integrated into, into material. You need to know you know, feel that you can commit to that. Um, and sometimes there's there's material that's included and it's like, oh, I, I, I don't, I don't, you know, where does that, where does that, how, 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 how strong is that? Um, or is it, you know, and then I think you could also take the view is, well, if it helps people, um, if it gives an insight, is that good enough? And I, I think so sometimes I think with some of those things, it's also about how you present it, that you're not necessarily present it as the whole truth. It's mm -hmm. this is a this is a snapshot. This is a and it might give you some some ways into looking at this. You know, theory, sometimes I think of it as being a bit like, um, you know, shedding light and a good theory will shed light on a particular area. It's it generally yeah. it simplifies and therefore brings some elements of a situation into sort of stark relief. But at the same time as it does that, it throws perhaps other bits. So it both shines light on an area, but also kind of obfuscates other bits. Um, so it's not telling the whole story. But it may it may be helpful. So I think it's also about how we present things, um, that it can help us to think things through. Because the world is yeah. so complex, um, you know, learning is a very multifaceted yeah. sort of thing, and and how people learn is so different, and in different situations, and depending on what we're learning as well. And where we are mm -hmm. in our learning journey, are we a beginner? Are we developing mastery? All of those elements. I know, I know people won't be able to see this, but I've got the biggest grin on my face right now because my world is leadership and that's what I talk about all the time. That's where my, you know, my work focus is. And what you've just said describes how I feel about leadership training. I think I can show you as many theories as you want. You only have to Google leadership and there's hundreds and millions of them. But actually, you you need to be selective and you need to think about which of those is going to work for you in your context, in your situation. And that that is a bit of a light bulb moment there for me, Rachel, actually. So thank you, because that's made me think, actually, well, learning theory is exactly the same. Mm. There is a lot of it what is going to work for me in my situation? What are the bits that are useful? And I think one of the great things about the pandemic, if there has been a great thing about the pandemic, is is the ability to, you know, there has been a, it feels like there's been a plethora of free webinars and things you can go on now. And some of those I've gone to and I've taken nothing from. Some I've gone to and I've taken a little mini chunk but it's that has, has been added to my practice. If I, you know, my practice bucket, let's call it that. Mm. Yeah. My bucket of stuff that I take with me when I, when I go to all these, you know, kind of interim roles, but that has been added to my little bucket. And ultimately I feel that that's made me better at what I do. And, and, you know, that's, we're back to the involvement refinement um, piece there, which is, a, again, it feels like it's one of our key themes here. Mm. 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 I wonder if we're getting to the close and a sort of 
point for us because we've we've been talking quite a lot about <laughs> the needing to keep refining our practice mm. the need need to look critically at learning theory and be more yeah. curious about it absolutely more questioning of it mm-hmm. are there other i mean what for you has been a key thing we've talked about the need to go wider yeah I think the need to go wider as well. Let's not just get caught up in, oh, it's learning theory, lovely, right, okay, tick in the box. I think the more you read, the more it helps you develop your ideas. You know, I mentioned, you know, Kim Scott, you know, the other thing that's been quite Mm. fundamental for me this year has been Rebel Ideas by Matthew Syed. It's not a particularly new book, but I think it just made me think about... um, you know, bringing people together from different spaces in the organization creates a better conversation, creates a better challenge. And this is nothing new, but it just kind of gave me a, a theory, if you like, to kind of justify why we do this um, in terms of, you know, it's a clash of ideas. But out of that clash of ideas, you get a better outcome mm. and people bring different perspectives to the table and it can be quite easy to get sucked down a rabbit hole and, and bring people together from whole of one department, let's say, or from whole of one team. It doesn't necessarily help. So maybe there's a, I'm going to take this one step further, Rachel, so just bear with me. But maybe there's a lesson here about, do we bring other people into L&D to give us a better perspective on what we're doing? You know, I think sometimes L&D can feel quite insular. We have lots of L&D meetings with just L&D people in. Um, and maybe bringing some of our stakeholders who you mentioned earlier, um, bringing some of our, if we call them customers, but people who attend learning, people who are the recipients of learning into there, that's going to give us that different perspective and and really make us think and challenge more about what we do. Hmm. And maybe being more transparent about what the thinking is behind. So maybe that's where we have to start sharing Mm. perhaps what some of that learning theory is behind it but I mean not in a in a a complicated and confusing way but just to share that and to test it actually with those those people Mm -hmm. interesting it's been a great pleasure talking with you (laughs) Helen I've really loved finally getting to talk with you about learning theory (laughs) Yeah, and me. And and actually, thank you, because it's it's kind of provoked me to think some more on this topic. (laughs) Thanks, Rachel. Thank you. One of the favourite bits of recording is knowing that we have a topic and knowing we have guests lined up and just hearing how they interpret it. This episode's a great example of what you're expecting to happen and hear is one thing, but it goes in a way that you didn't expect. There are bits in this that I'll be going back to again and again, and I'm really pleased that we managed to capture all the show notes. Please do look at them, because they're quite quite extensive. You'll also find Helen and, and Rachel's contact details in there. We're really, really pleased and, and thank them enormously for their input. We're pretty much always recording, so please do get in touch if you have something to say. Please hit the like and subscribe buttons on your podcast player, to make it easier for people to find us. It really, really does make a difference. Please take care, and we'll see you again soon.